السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ والا علیہ و صحاب ہی اجمعین اما بعد مائی برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ویلکم آل آف یو فار اے اسٹڈی آف اے سبجیکٹ وچ از ونس اگین کنیکٹڈ ٹو دا ویری فاؤنڈیشن آف آر ریلیجن اینڈ دا ٹاپک ٹوڈے از دا میتھڈولوجی آف فالوئنگ اسکالرس ایز وی نو In Islam, seeking knowledge is compulsory on every Muslim. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said in a hadith recorded in Sunan Ibn Majah with an authentic chain of narration, Talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every single Muslim. Now we find there are several evidences of this which we have already covered in our lecture on the importance of seeking knowledge. I am only briefly mentioning some things why there's a very important reason. The first point is all the ayat, all the ahadith which talk about the importance of seeking knowledge. This is the first category of evidences. The second category of evidences are all the ayat which talk about pondering over the message of the Quran, pondering over the message in Islam. For example, Surah Muhammad, Surah 47 verse 24. Allah says, Afala yatadabbaroon al-Quran. Why don't they ponder over the Quran? Am ala qulubin aqfaluha or are their hearts locked up? Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to not only try to understand the Quran, Allah has told us to even ponder over the message of the Quran. If we don't understand the Quran, then how can we ponder over the message? Besides, the third category of evidences are all the ayat, all the ahadith which are against ignorance. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah 6, verse 35, "Fala takunanna min al-jahlin." Never be of those who are ignorant. My brothers and sisters, this topic is vast. That seeking knowledge is compulsory. This is an established fact for every single Muslim. A Muslim cannot be ignorant. Allah has said, "Never be from the ignorant." Allah says that Musa alayhi salam said, "Auzu billahi an akuna min al-jahlin." I seek Allah's refuge that I should be from those who are ignorant. Having seen this. Let's move ahead to the second step. The second point is that yes, it is compulsory to seek knowledge, but that does not mean that we can manage without ulama. We can manage without scholars, and we don't need any scholars. Oh, I'm reading Sahih Bukhari myself. I don't need any alim. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because Allah has mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nahl, Surah 16, verse 43, and Surah Lambiya, Surah 21, verse 7. First, Alu Ahl Dikri. In kuntum la ta'lamun, ask those who possess the message if you don't know. So if you don't know, Allah has not said that just do whatever you understand. If you don't know, whatever you do, it's okay. Allah has said if you don't know, then ask the people of knowledge. We have to ask the people of knowledge. They have great importance in Islam. Why? Because they are the people who have understood the message. We have to refer to them to understand the Quran. understand the sunnah understand the rulings of fiqh we have to refer to scholars if you don't know allah has said you refer to scholars don't just do anything so this is very important because there are some people who come to an erroneous understanding somehow that we just don't need scholars this is absolutely wrong look at this hadith our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he warned us in a hadith recorded in sunan abu daud with authentic chain of narration he said that there are three types of judges one is the judge who judges with justice and with knowledge he will go to jannah second is the judge who judges unjustly he will go to jahannam but the third judge the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said wa rajulun qada lin nas the person who judges over people ala jahl without knowledge he judges without knowledge prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said about him fa huwa fin nar he is in the fire of hell meaning if you judge in a matter without ilm in an issue without knowledge the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that fa huwa fin nar this person is in the fire of hell so this is a formula to go to the hell is to judge in a matter without sufficient knowledge and my brothers and sisters we all understand incomplete knowledge is dangerous we know this in worldly matters if a person says that yes yes i know something about flying a plane i'll fly a plane i'm not a trained pilot but i have seen maybe i played some games and i am sure that i can fly a plane we will say no 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 let a trained pilot fly the plane if there is a operation to be done and someone says yes i think i can also cut open and i think i can figure out what is there and i can do things 
we will say no you can't cut open this is not allowed let a trained doctor a trained surgeon experienced person let him do this so my brothers and sisters in worldly matters we follow this then how is it that in matters of religion a person feels that we just don't need scholars and we all can come to our own conclusions no we need to refer to scholars and this is what islam has taught us the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith recorded in musnad ahmad with a hasan chain of narration he said laysa minna he is not one of us man lam yujil kabirana who does not respect our elders wa yarham sagirana and does not have mercy on our young ones and does not recognize the rights of our scholars. So my brothers and sisters, this should be established and very clear in our minds. We need to refer to scholars. I have given you only three evidences, but there are plenty of evidences. We have seen two points. First point was seeking knowledge is compulsory. We are not saying that scholars are enough. Now you don't need to seek any knowledge at all. Now you be ignorant. Seeking knowledge is compulsory. Don't go to any of these extremes. That no scholars are there. I don't need to seek knowledge. Oh, I'm seeking knowledge. I don't need scholars. Both the positions are wrong. The right way is in between. Yes, we need to refer to scholars. We also need to seek knowledge so that we can understand and appreciate in a better way what scholars tell us. And we can move on on the path of knowledge to get better and better understanding of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Islam. But, however, people make a certain mistake in the matter of following scholars, they take it to another extreme. We should know that all the great ulama, the scholars of this ummah, they are our scholars. What has Allah said? Fasalu ahla dhikri. Ask the people of knowledge. All the people of knowledge, they are ours who are following the authentic methodology. They are our scholars. We should not be dividing them among ourselves. Allah did not say, Fasalu ahadu min ahli dhikri. Ask only one of the people of knowledge. Yes, a person may refer to one of the people of knowledge who is more accessible, who is more available, whom he can understand better, whom he can understand and appreciate better. That's not a problem. But let us know that all the scholars of Islam, they are ours. We should not categorize and we should not say that this is my scholar, this is yours. We should not draw outlines and borders and divide ourselves into groups and sects on the basis of following scholars. So we have, for example, the four great Imams. Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah Imam Shafi Rahmatullah Imam Malik Rahmatullah Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal Rahmatullah My brothers and sisters, we should understand that the goal of these scholars and all the scholars of Islam was to take us to the Quran and the Sunnah. We are doing ittiba of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are not doing ittiba of one of the great scholars. We respect them. We love them for the sake of Allah. We respect all the scholars of Islam. But we are doing ittiba of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The scholars tried to take us to the Quran and the Sunnah, and Allah has given the methodology of following scholars in Surah Nisa, Surah four, verse fifty-nine. Allah says, "Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe, atiyu Allah, obey Allah, wa atiyu Rasul, obey the Messenger, wa uli lamri minkum, and also obey those in authority among you." Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah has said, "Who are the ulul amr?" He says, "An Ibn Abbas, ulul amri minkum, yani ahlul fiqh wa din." Ibn Abbas said that ulul amr are the people of fiqh, the people of understanding fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence and din. And he said, "Wa kada qala mujahid, mujahid, the student of Ibn Abbas also said this. Wa Ata, wal Hasan Basri, Ata and Hasan Basri also said this. Wa Abu Aliya, ulul amri minkum, yani ulama." Abu Aliya said. These ulul amra ulama was zahiru. Imam Ibn Kathir says the apparent meaning. Wallahu alam and Allah knows best. Anha ammatun fi kulli ulul amr. That this is general for all the ulul amr. Min al umara wal ulama kama taqaddama. Umara the caliphs the people who are ruling us and the ulama kama taqaddama as has been mentioned earlier. So my brothers and sisters, who are the ulul amr? The ulul amra the ulama. And the hukam, the rulers of Muslims, the Khalifa, and so on. Allah said, "Obey Allah, obey the Messenger, and also the ulul amr." Now, brothers and sisters, when we are on the issue of atiullah wa atiul rasul, there is no difference of opinion. If someone asks you who is the Messenger on whom you have iman, you will say it is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
If another person is asked, a third Muslim is asked, a fourth Muslim is asked, who's your messenger? Everyone will say, I will say, it's Muhammad sallallahu Is there any ikhtilaf? No ikhtilaf. But when we say, okay, ulul amr, the ulama, which scholar will you refer to? So one person will say, I will refer to so-and-so. Another person will say, I will refer to so-and-so. I may say that I will refer to so-and-so. So my brothers and sisters, this is where the ikhtilaf comes. And that is the reason in this very verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned after this third category. And this third category, ulul amr, is mentioned only in this one place in the Quran after Atiullah wa Atiul Rasul. And Allah continues further in this verse, Fain tana zatum fi shayin. If you differ in any matter, Allah knows that when we tell people to refer to ulama, that is where they will differ. And that is where the differences will come. So Allah has given the formula of solving differences in this very verse. Allah says, Fain tana zatum fi shayin. Farudduhu illallahi wa rasul. Then refer to Allah. And his messenger. In kuntum tu minuna billah wal yawm il akhir. If you really believe in Allah and in the last day, what should we do? If we differ in any matter, we refer to Allah and his messenger. Allah has not mentioned that if you differ in any matter, then do a head count. How many votes for this issue? How many votes for this masala? No, no, no. Allah has not mentioned that when you differ in any matter, just see whatever your father is doing, just do what your father does. Allah has not mentioned that if you differ in any matter, then you need to see what the imam of your area or the people of your area are doing. Just do that very same thing. Allah has said, if you differ in any matter, then refer to Allah and his messenger. Refer to Allah means refer to the book of Allah, Imam Ibn Kathir said. And refer to the messenger means refer to the sayings of the messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is the ahadith. So my brothers and sisters, in matters of differences, we have to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. We have to see which of the scholars have strong evidence. We have to follow whichever scholar has evidences. And after it becomes clear in any matter, we cannot say that, no, no, I'm the follower of this alim. I'm the follower of this imam. Even if the other scholar has proofs, he's a scholar. We are not talking about a person himself coming up with his own fatwa from the Quran and the Sunnah with his own incomplete knowledge. We are talking of a scholar of Islam who has proof from the Quran, from the Sunnah, who has proof. And we say that no, even though he has proof, even though he has clear evidences, I am a follower of this Imam. If we say that, then we are going against what Allah has said in the Quran. Allah has said, if you differ in any matter, then refer to Allah and his messenger. Meaning whichever of the scholars has got proof from the Quran and the Sunnah, we have to accept that opinion as the final opinion. If we differ in any matter, this is what we should do. And then Allah says, khayrun. In this, there will be good for you. And there will be the best consequence, the best results. What we are saying in this entire subject can be summarized in this slide. We are saying we don't subscribe to that view that there should be no scholars. Nor are we saying that there should be stubborn blind following of scholars. The right way is the way in between that we respect the scholars and whichever scholar has got proof from the Quran, from the Sunnah, we accept that and we follow it all of us. We don't need to be on any of these two extremes. My brothers and sisters, there's another extreme. There are some people who just don't have any tolerance in matters of religion. They think that their view is the final view and no other view can have the chance of being correct. On the other hand, there are people who in the name of tolerance have given up seeking the truth. They have given up. They say no. 2 plus 2, 4. 2 plus 2, 5. 2 plus 2, 6. Everyone is correct. We are tolerant to everyone. But there's a difference in being tolerant and missing out what is the truth. We need to know what is the truth. What is the right issue? What is the right masala? We need to know the truth. On the other hand, we should be tolerant to others. We should understand that in matters of fiqh, people are seeking evidences, they're looking at evidences, some evidence may occur to someone, some great alim, something may not occur. It can happen and in these kind of issues, there should be tolerance and the right way is in between, the middle way, the way of seeking the truth and having tolerance. We come to the third section of today's lecture. In this third section, we are going to look at the methodology that never ever should it happen that we put the statement of any scholar above the Quran and the Sunnah. My brothers and sisters, this should not happen. Why? Because Allah has said in the Quran, the first reason is 
a verse in the Quran, Surah 9, verse 31, Surah Tawbah. Allah says, Ittakhadu ahbaraham wa ruhbanahum arbaba min dunillah. They have taken their scholars, their rabbis and their priests as rab other than Allah. Who they? The Jews and the Christians. The Jews and the Christians, they have taken their rabbis and their priests as rab other than Allah. Their rab, their lord is not Allah. It's along with Allah, they also have their rabbis and their priests. In commentary of this verse of the Quran, we have a hadith in Sunan Tirmidhi. We have the Sahabi of the Prophet وسلم, Adi ibn Hatim, who asked the Prophet Oh Prophet وسلم, they don't worship them. The Jews and the Christians, they don't really worship them. So the Prophet وسلم, explained to him, and this is what makes us realize the importance of the subject. Allah Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu said, Ama innahum lam yakunu yabudunahum. Yes, they don't worship them. They don't do their ibadat. They don't do acts of ibadah for their fathers, for their priests, for their rabbis. No, they don't do acts of ibadah. But what do they do? Walakinnahum kanu idha hallu lahum shayyan istahallu. But when they would make anything halal, so they consider it as halal. Wa idha haramu alihim shayyan faharamu. And when they, their rabbis and priests, make something haram, so they, the Jews and the Christians, they consider it as haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, the Jews and the Christians make one mistake. What mistake? The halal and haram of their religion comes from their rabbis and priests. For us, halal and haram comes from Allah and His Messenger. No scholar can say, I have made it haram. I make it haram. No scholar has the authority to make it haram. He is supposed to convey the halal and the haram, which is there in the Quran and the Sunnah, which has come from Allah and His Messenger. He is conveying the halal and the haram. The scholars don't have the right to make halal and haram. If we give this right of making halal and haram to the scholar, if we raise them to the pedestal, we say that this scholar, he has such authority, he can make halal and haram. Then Allah has said in this verse of the Quran that they have made them rub. Because our Rabb has the right to make things halal and make things haram. My brothers and sisters, let us understand this concept. We respect scholars. We refer to scholars. But if any issue, any matter, any scholar's opinion goes against the Quran and the Sunnah, we cannot say that, no, no, I'm a follower of the scholar. I'm not going to leave his opinion. Even if it is against the Quran and the Sunnah, if we put the statement of a scholar above the Quran and the Sunnah, then effectively in reality, we have made him a rub along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first reason why we should not fall into this grave mistake. The second reason, a believer has no choice. Allah says in the Quran in Surah 33 verse 36, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ It is not fitting for a believer. وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ Or a believing woman. A believing man or a believing woman, it is not fitting for them. When Allah and His Messenger come with a decision, in that matter, they have any option in their decision. Allah said, No, the believing man, the believing woman, they just don't have the choice. After the decision of Allah and His Messenger come, we cannot say, Oh, I think I will still follow so and so. When you know for sure that this is what Allah has said, this is what the Messenger of Allah has said. When the matter is clear, then a believer cannot have choice. Yes, if the matter is not clear, if you are studying, the issue is not clear for you, you are seeking knowledge, it is not clear, then in that matter, a person has chance, he is answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot judge on the person. But after it becomes clear, a believer has no choice in this regard. And so much that Allah has said in Surah 465, that's point number three, we are looking at three, three evidences of every position. Three, three evidences so that the point of view is established and we can go ahead and understand the whole subject. There's a verse in the Quran in Surah Nisa, Surah 465. Allah says, Fala bika, And no, by your Lord, by your Lord, the Lord of Muhammad Sallallahu that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La yuminuna, they don't have iman. Hatta yuhakkimuka fima shajara baynahum. Until they don't make you the final judge in all their disputes. Until they don't make Muhammad the final judge in all their disputes, Allah says they don't have Iman. 
ثم لا يجدوا في أنفسهم حرجا مما قضيت and then they don't find in their souls any resistance regarding what the Prophet ﷺ has decided. When you sallimu taslima and accept it and submit before it with full submission. Meaning, my brothers and sisters, a believer, after a decision comes from the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, Allah says that it is not halal for him, it is not allowed for him, that he should have any option. Rather, he should accept it with his whole heart, completely with full submission. It should not be that he's accepting, but oh, I'm not so willing. I'm not so happy about it. I'm accepting it, but I'm not so happy. Allah says, then you're not a believer yet. For being a believer, you have to accept it with the fullest conviction and fullest submission. So now we come to the next section that what really are the problems in the stubborn blind following of scholars? If a person accepts the methodology that no, I'm a follower of the scholar. I am not going to leave his opinion. I am a follower of this scholar. I love this scholar. I like this scholar. I am not going to leave his opinion even if he's wrong. Even if there are evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. I am a follower of this scholar. If a person comes to this understanding. If a person comes to a stubborn following. Stubborn. Meaning he is just stuck. That you are shaking him. He is not going to get shaken. I am firmly entrenched in following this particular scholar. If he does that. What is the problem? We have already seen this is a matter of making someone else the rub. This is a matter where believers don't have choice. This is a matter where Allah says that they don't have Iman if they don't make Prophet Muhammad the final judge. Besides, we also find that what will really happen is that a person who adopts this position, he will end up missing so many sunnahs of the Prophet So many sunnahs which the other scholars have, he is missing them out. Why? Because he's a stubborn follower of one scholar. Now he has accepted and declared that as his methodology, I am a follower of only this scholar. Other than the other issues, which is the matter between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you and I are not supposed to go and put any judgment on them because we don't know what is inside. Maybe he has some valid explanation for whatever he is doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge. But what does remain if he has accepted this as his position, he is going to miss out on so many sunnahs of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. Second, he will end up putting the statement of someone else above the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And thirdly, what will happen is that differences will remain unsolved. Meaning, we know my brothers and sisters that scholars have differences. What to do when there are differences? Come, I have this evidence. What evidence do you have? A scholar says to another that we have this proof. What proof do you have? We have people who will go to this scholar will say, Sheikh, scholar, Maulana, what scholar, what evidences do you have? They go to another Sheikh, they say, what evidences do you have? If it becomes clear upon them that this Sheikh, this scholar has got proof from the Quran and the Sunnah, they follow the opinion which is stronger. They leave the opinion which is weaker. They follow the opinion which has proof. They leave the opinion which has no proof. They follow the opinion which is in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. And leave the opinion which has the fact of human error. But this brings us to the next section. Section number 5. People say that such a big scholar, how can he be mistaken? How can you say that our alim, our imam, our scholar, he is mistaken? Who are you to say he is mistaken? How can you say such a thing that such a big scholar, he is mistaken? How can he be mistaken? We will be looking at only three reasons. The first reason, he is a human being. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. All the children of Adam, they make mistakes. All. Wa khayrul khattain at-tawabun. The best of those who make these mistakes are the ones who constantly repent. So all children of Adam, they make mistakes. As human beings, we make mistakes. This is not something blameworthy on the scholar. My brothers and sisters, I want to share with you a hadith which will help all of us to have a lot of compassion and mercy in this subject and be able to understand better what's happening. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith recorded in Sahih Bukhari, he said, إِذَا حَكَمَ الْحَاكِمْ فَجْتَاهْدَ When the judge judges and he does ijtihad, he goes through the entire process of coming to a decision following the methodology of the Quran and the Sunnah. If he is correct, he will get double ajr. Two rewards, double the reward. And when he judges and does ijtihad, and yet he makes a mistake, 
So he will still get one rewards. So we are saying that these scholars of Islam, even when they make mistakes, inshallah, they will get that one reward mentioned by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa However, if that mistake becomes clear and open for you or me, and we say, no, 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 I'm a follower of this scholar. I'm a follower of this imam. I'm not going to leave a statement. Even if he's mistaken, I'm not going to leave a statement. Are we going to get that one reward? No. Why? How can we expect reward for choosing the opinion of someone over the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ presented by other scholars? How can we get reward for this? How can we expect reward? Did the Imam scholar deliberately make a mistake to get that one reward? No. He was seeking the truth as we saw truth and tolerance. He was after the truth. He ended up making a mistake as a human being. So the first point is all human beings make mistakes. Second point, I'm asking a question. Is it possible or not that some hadith may have not reached that scholar? It may be possible that some hadith has not reached that scholar. Now people say, oh, you think such a great scholar? For example, Imam Abu Hanifa Ramtulale, born in 80 Hijri, he did not get the hadith. Or Imam Shafi Ramtulale, born in 150 Hijri, he did not get the hadith. Or Imam Ahmad Ramtulale, born in 164 Hijri, he did not get the hadith. Or Imam Malik Ramtulale, born in 93 Hijri, he did not get the hadith. How can they not get the hadith? So we are not going to talk of 80, 93, 150, 164. We will talk of 0 Hijri. We will talk of the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The period immediately after Hijrah, the period of Medina, the between Hijrah and 10 years, 0 to 10 Hijri. We will talk about the people born before 0 Hijri. The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And my brothers and sisters, I want to share with you an example. We have a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Once Abu Musa Ashari radilanhu, he came at the door of Umar radilam and asked permission, said salam. Umar radilam did not reply, he was busy. Abu Musa Ashari said salam the second time. He said salam the third time. No reply, he went away. Umar radilam, as soon as he got free, he said, I heard the voice of Abdullah bin Qais. Abu Musa Radulam. He said, call him. When Abu Musa Radulam was called, Umar Radulam asked him that, why did you go back? He said, this is what the Prophet Sallallahu instructed us. Umar Radulam said, get proof for this. Otherwise, you will get this punishment. And sometimes, as a measure of stopping fitna, some strictness is applied to good people so that the bad people can understand themselves. Umar Radulam was applying that rule where he was a little strict with Abu Musa so that people of fitna can understand that if we try to do something, what is going to happen with us? Abu Musa, Radilam, he went out, he asked people, he came across some Ansari Sahaba. He said, who among you know this hadith? They said, we all know, but they sent the youngest among them, that is Abu Sayyid Khudri. Abu Sayyid Khudri comes to Omar Radilam, he gives testimony that yes, this is what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And when Omar Radilam heard that, read his words. He said, This statement of the Prophet ﷺ was remained hidden from me. I missed it out because I used to be busy in the markets and business. Now this is Umar Adana, the second Khalifa of Islam. He's from Ashra and Mubashira. He's the person about whom the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has made the truth come from the tongue of Umar. When he can miss a hadith, then can't Abu Hanifa Ramtulale miss a hadith in 80 Hijri? And can't Imam Shafi Ramtulale miss a hadith in 150 Hijri? And can't Imam Ahmed miss a hadith in 164 Hijri? And can't Imam Malik miss a hadith in 93 Hijri? This is so frequent in the books of hadith. We find one Sahabi telling a hadith to a second Sahabi and he says that I did not know this hadith. When it can happen with them, why can't it happen with later people? And thirdly, you answer this question, is it possible or not that maybe they knew the hadith but just did not recollect it at the time of taking a view or decision on the particular issue or the masala while deciding that issue, they just did not recall that hadith in that context and fit that hadith into that place. Is it possible or not? I will give you two examples. The first example is of the Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ, Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu anh, the Sahabi known for knowledge the Sahabi known to be an expert in matters of fitna, whom Umar Adala also used to refer to. He was known to be a scholar. 
and we find the hadith about him recorded in Sunan Abu Dawud and we read the hadith anna hudhaifata amma nas bil madain ala dukan hudhaifa radhiyallahu he was leading people in salah in the city of madain ala dukan he was on a kind of a platform he was higher than the people the people were down the imam was a little higher than the people fa akhaza abu masud bi qamisihi fa jabazahu abu masud radhiyallahu he caught his kameez and pulled him down falamma faragha min salatihi qala alam ta'lam annahum kanu yunhauna an zalik when he finished his salah hudayfa bin yaman finished salah so abu masud radhiyallahu said to hudayfa bin yaman don't you know that people were prohibited from doing this what that the imam is higher than the people behind him people were prohibited from this now read the answer of hudayfa bin yaman hudayfa bin yaman radhiyallahu he said قال بلا قد ذكرت حين مددتني he said yes i remembered when you helped me i remembered when you helped me he did not say when you insulted me auzu billah because this was not their spirit they were eager to get the truth even if the way and the manner is a little bit difficult or rough at times they were interested in getting the truth he said when you helped me that time i recollected now see this hadith hudafa bin yaman knew this hadith he had forgotten he did not recollect it can happen with people this is how human beings are let us look at a second example in a hadith recorded in sunan abu daud once again about umar radhiyallahu anhu uti umar bi majnuna qad zanat one majnuna one woman who had gone insane she was brought to umar radhiyallahu anhu qad zanat she had done zina adultery and you know the punishment for adultery in zina if the woman or the man is married it is stoning to death fas tashara fi haunas Umar al-Dalam he consulted people, and Umar al-Dalam used to consult the Sahaba from Badr, senior Sahaba, knowledgeable people. He consulted them. Farmara biha Umar an turjam. Umar al-Dalam gave the command that this woman should be stoned to death, the punishment for adultery in Islam. Murra biha ala Ali bin Abi Talib, Ridwanullahi alai. Fakala ma shanu hadi. She was being taken, and they passed near Ali bin Abi Talib al-Dalam. and he asked what is the matter of this woman qalu majnuna bani fulan zanat fa amara biha umar an turjam they said she is a insane woman from bani fulan from this tribe and she has done zina and umar ibn al-lam has given the command that she should be stoned to death qala fa qala arjiha biha thumma atahu ali ibn al-lam said please take her back and he also came fa qala ya amir al-mu'minin he said o oh, amir al-mu'minin amma alimta don't you know the hadith ان القلم قد رفع عن ثلاث ذا بن از ريس فروم ثري بيبل ان المجنون حتى يبرا فروم ذا انسين بيرسون انتل هي سينسز كم باك وان النايم حتى يستيقظ فروم ذا سليبينج بيرسون انتل هي ويكس اب وان السبي حتى ياكل فروم ذا تشايلد انتل هي سينسز كم باك وات ديد عمر رضي الله عنه قال بلا عمر رضي الله عنه يس اي نو ذات حديث قال فما بال هذه ترجم سو علي رضي الله عنه سيد ذن واي شود شي بي ستوند His her pen is raised. Pen is raised, meaning the sins are not written. Sins are not written. Then what is the blame? So Ali Abdul Rahman said, "Fama balu hadhi turjam." Kala la shay. Why should she be stoned when there is no sin, when there is no blame? Then how there is punishment? So Umar Abdul Rahman said, "Yes, there should be nothing." And then Ali Abdul Rahman said, "Kala farsilha." Then she should be freed. Kala farsalha. Umar Abdul Rahman freed her. Kala fajala yukabir. Umar al then started to read the takbir Allah Akbar Allah Akbar why Allah saved him from a mistake but now my brothers and sisters what do we learn we learn it can happen a person knows the hadith Umar al knew that hadith but when he consulted people and gave the judgment on that insane woman at that time he just did not recollect this hadith and this is what happens when it can happen with Umar al Why can't it happen with all the great scholars of Islam? But this brings us to another question, and that's section number six. Why do people leave the Quran and the Sunnah to follow a scholar? What do they have? We will look at three reasons. The first reason: the Sunnah has been divided by these scholars among themselves. Firstly and obviously, we can see that these scholars did not exist at one time and era. then where did this kind of a meeting happen where they decided okay i am going to take this sunna and you take this sunna and you take this sunna and think of it if all the scholars they divided the sunnas equally 
then how much does one of them get? What percentage does he get? 25%. And how much does he leave? 75%. You mean to say Allah must understand that these scholars, they left out 75% of the sunnah. If they took 25% and they left out 75%, this is absolutely wrong. So those people who have put forward this kind of an argument, this is a very erroneous and wrong and an insulting argument for the imams of fiqh and we don't allege them to have done this. Second reason what people say is that see all of these scholars are correct. All of them are correct. If you mean that all of these scholars are scholars of Islam, are scholars of the Quran and the Sunnah, then yes, we agree and we accept. In fact, we are going to see the statements and the methodology taught by these scholars to their followers. However, if what a person means that all of these scholars are correct in every single issue, then this is wrong. Why? For example, if you are in the state of wudu and if you have an injury and you bleed and blood flows from your wound, then people will ask you, are you Hanafi or a Shafi? If you are a Hanafi, your wudu is broken. And if you are a Shafi, then your wudu is not broken. On the other hand, if you are in the state of wudu and you happen to touch a woman who is a non-mehram, then according to the Shafi fiqh, your wudu is broken and according to the Hanafi fiqh, your wudu is not broken. Now these two are just two examples. The point is, either wudu is broken or it is not broken. It cannot be that the wudu is there and not there at the same time. It cannot be that wuzu is valid and invalidated at the same time. It cannot be. And we find that there are differences of opinion in various issues in matters of salah, in matters of wudu, in matters of nikah, in matters of talaq. It won't be that the salah is valid and invalid, nikah is valid and invalid, talaq is valid and invalid. It can't be. So there are so many issues and there are scholars who have compiled these differences. What we say is that we respect the scholars. We respect the research they put in. We respect the efforts they put in. And we feel and perceive from within our hearts that in matters where they deferred also, one of the scholars has got double reward and the second of the scholars has got one reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the effort he's put in. However, both are not correct. And we have to strive and seek knowledge. And when we seek knowledge, we don't have to tie ourselves down with stubborn blind following of one of the scholars that no, I'm a follower of so-and-so. I'm not going to leave his statement, come what may. This is wrong. However, there are some issues where there are multiple practices of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, we find the method of Vitr. The Prophet ﷺ prayed Vitr in many different ways. But there should be authentic proof of that particular opinion. Then we can follow. Not merely because it has been mentioned by a great scholar. How can he be wrong? He's a human being. We should understand this. This brings us to the third reason which people put forward, they say, see, the layman, he cannot do research. So let him just blindly follow one of the scholars and never ever look on any other side. He's a follower of that scholar. No need to look at the evidences of any other scholar. No need to seek evidences. No need to seek knowledge. Just follow your scholar. That's it. I'm asking you, my brothers and sisters, please think of this. If that layman does any action of shirk, if he's prostrating before other than Allah, if he's doing dua to other than Allah, then will we say you are a layman, you can't understand, you continue to do shirk. Will we say that to him? If he's a layman and he's doing innovations in religion, then will we say to him that no, you are a layman, you cannot understand, you continue to do innovations in religion. For you, it's allowed because you're a layman. Even in worldly matters, that layman, he goes to purchase gold or he goes to purchase something else from the market. He has senses and ability. He's smart and wise. He can check up. But when we come to Masail in religion, no, no, he's a layman. He just can't understand. Isn't this a double standard? Is this fair on the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa That we tell people that no, you can't understand. So you don't seek knowledge. Are we trying to put religion out of the reach of the layman? My brothers and sisters, this layman is encouraged to seek knowledge. After aqidah, the first thing in ibadah is salah. Our Prophet said, Swallu kama tumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me praying. So we tell him you seek knowledge about salah. Even if you learn one thing from our Prophet even if you are able to correct one mistake, it will be corrected in every single rakat. It will be corrected in every single salah. 
And when finally he stands before Allah on the day of judgment, even if he has corrected just one single mistake, it will make a significant difference in his account on the day of judgment. This brings us to another misunderstanding and this is the seventh and the second last section of today's this lecture. And that is the understanding among many people that we have to, have to compulsorily follow one of the four scholars of fiqh. One of these four imams we have to follow. Some people go to the extent of saying, if you don't follow one of these four imams, then your imam is shaitan. Is this correct? No. There have been many scholars of fiqh, many. If we look at only those times itself, we have Imam Abu Hanifa Ramtulale, we also have Imam Awzai born in 85 Hijri, five years after Imam Abu Hanifa. We also have Imam Malik, but we also have Imam Laz born in the same year as Imam Malik. And we have the statement from Imam Shafi who studied under Imam Malik and who studied under the students of Imam Laz. And he said that Imam Laz is a bigger scholar than Imam Malik. You and I cannot say such a statement. But Imam Shafi studied under both of these. He said Imam Laz is a bigger scholar than Imam Malik also. We have Imam as born in 96 Hijri. We also have Imam Shafi born in 150 Hijri. We have Imam Ahmad born in 164 Hijri. We also have Imam Dawood born in 192 Hijri. We have Imam Ibn Jarir al-Tabari born in 216 Hijri and so many other scholars. Scholars who compiled their fiqh, who gave answers. Now it happens that some fiqh was accepted by the government implemented by the government. Some scholar had very good students. Some scholar wrote many books. So we have the popularity of these four increased over times, but that doesn't mean that there were only four scholars. Second point is nowhere is there any verse in the Quran, in the Sunnah, where it is mentioned that you have to follow one of these four Imams. Otherwise your Imam is Shaitan. Otherwise you are deviant and misguided. Nowhere has it been compulsory. We say all four Imams and all the great scholars of Islam, they are our scholars. We respect and love them. Whoever has proof from the Quran and the Sunnah, we follow them. If someone has particular liking for any particular scholar, if someone feels that this scholar has got strong proof, I like his approach, you follow him for the time being, no problem. But if you become stubborn in following him, even after seeing evidences of another scholar which are far stronger, far superior, even if you see that he has the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, he has the proof, he has the truth, but you say, no, I'm a follower of this scholar, then this is wrong. It can be for the time being a person is referring to a scholar, there is no problem in this. We come to the last section of today's lecture. We will look at the statements of what did the Imams of Fiqh themselves teach? What did they say? Did they say that become my follower, never leave my statement, don't look left and right towards anyone else, only follow me. Did they say this? No. What did they say? We have the statement of Imam Abu Hanifa Ramtulale when he said, La ya had, it is not halal for anyone. And ya khuda bikawlina to accept my statement, ma'alam ya'lam inayna khadnahu until you don't know from where I have taken. If you don't know from where I have taken, then it is not halal for you to take my statement. You should know from where I have taken, from what evidences have I concluded this, what are my evidences. If you don't know my evidences, then don't take my statement. Where is he connecting us? He's connecting us with the Quran and the Sunnah. He also said, "Ida qultu qawlan yukhalifu kitab Allah wa khabra Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fatruku qawli. If I say to you any statement which goes against the book of Allah or the statement of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then leave my statement. He did not say, find some excuse to follow my statement. Try to justify my statement. He did not say that. He said, leave my statement. We have the statement of Imam Malik rahimahullah who said, Innama ana bashar, I'm only a human being. Ukhti wa usib, I make mistakes and I'm also correct. Fanzuru fi rai, look at my opinion. Fakullu ma wafaq al kitab wa sunnah fakudu, whatever you find according to the Quran and the sunnah, take it. Wakullu ma lam yuwafaq al kitab wa sunnah fatruku, and whatever goes against the Quran and the sunnah, leave it. This is the methodology taught by Imam Malik rahimahullah. Then we have the statement of Imam Malik where he has said, there's not even a single person after the Prophet Except that some of his statements will be taken and some of his statements will be left except the Prophet Imam Shafi Rahimahullah, what did he say? Ajmal Muslimun. There is a consensus of the Muslims. Muslims are unanimous about this. I had said to you, we will see what is the consensus about this is the matter about which there is consensus. He said, 
that the person who finds the sunnah of the messenger it is not permissible for him to leave the sunnah of the messenger for anyone else's statement there is ijma of the muslims there is consensus of the muslims that the person who gets a sunnah from the messenger of allah it is not halal for him it is not permissible for him to leave the sunnah for the statement of someone else. This is not halal. This is the matter on which there is consensus. We have the statement of Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah who said, لا تقلدني ولا تقلد مالكا ولا الشافعي ولا الأوزاعي ولا ثوري وخذ من حيث وخذو Don't blindly follow me, nor blindly follow Malik, nor Shafi, nor Auzai, nor ثوري وخذ من حيث وخذو Take from where we all have taken. Where have they taken from? They have taken from the Quran and the Sunnah. So my brothers and sisters, this subject is before you. Now there are extreme positions. There are people who try to straw man the entire whole thing and try to quote things out of context and try to refute it. Why are we doing this? This is a disservice to the Sunnah of the Messenger We love him. We have read his kalima. We also love and respect the scholars. We don't follow the extreme opinion that we don't need scholars. This is absolutely wrong. We started from there. But we should know that whenever any scholar comes with a proof from the Quran and the Sunnah, we are not going to say, I don't follow this scholar. We are not going to say, he's not my scholar. I was not born in this family. My brothers and sisters, I will end this lecture with one example. We all know that the Qibla was changed for the Sahaba. It was initially Baitul Maqdis and then it was changed to Masjid Al-Haram. And they followed it. They were ready, submissive, obedient. They changed their very Qibla. When the Wahi came, when the revelation came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they immediately changed it. They did not say, no, 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 we will follow the old Qibla. How can we do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them. And as Allah has said, it was a big test. They passed. Is this going to happen with us? No. This is not going to happen with us. It is not going to happen that the Qibla changes any day. It is not going to happen with us. But what happens with us is that we follow an opinion of a scholar thinking it to be the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah And then one fine day we come to know that this was a mistaken opinion and that scholar has got strong proof from the Quran and the Sunnah which shows clearly that that is the correct opinion and this opinion is wrong. Now what? Now the test is, are we going to leave the statement which we were following of that scholar and are we going to accept the proof from the Quran and the Sunnah which the other scholar is putting forward or are we going to say, no, 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 I'm the follower of this scholar, I'm not going to leave his opinion. This is how Allah tests us and really we should not fail because the loss is ours. What will we do with this world, my brothers and sisters? We're going to leave all of this, the society, the people, the community, what is going to happen? Are they going to help us in our grave? Is anyone going to help us on the day of judgment? But if we have the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa it will help us scale of deeds. It will help us on the day of judgment. So my brothers and sisters, avoid one of the extremes and the middle way, the way of seeking the truth, the way of having tolerance, the way of respecting scholars, the way of loving the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to the extent and degree that we don't put the statement of anyone above the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa I end with the dua, Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa warzukna tiba'a. Oh Allah, help us to understand the truth as the truth and to follow it. Wa arina al-batila batila warzukna chinaba. Oh Allah, help us to recognize and understand falsehood as falsehood and avoid it. Ameen wa akhru dawana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. This series is sponsored by one of our brother in Islam for Sadqai Jaria of his family. Aise hi aur videos banane mein hamari madad kare.